Bigness is the last bastion of architecture, a contraction, a hyper-architecture. The containers of Bigness will be landmarks in a post-architectural landscape, a world scraped of architecture in the way Richter's paintings are scraped of paint, inflexible, immutable, definitive, forever there, generated through superhuman effort. Bigness surrenders the field to after architecture. Hello, we're back again to talk about Realm Cool House. It's very exciting. You're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. I'm George Kinjal. And we're talking about the Office of Metropolitan Architects in the late 1980s. Hmm. Mostly, and a little bit in the early 1990s. Yeah, so this is the firm of Rem Koolhaas, uh, founded by Rem Koolhaas, Elias Zengelis, uh, and their partners Madelon Vriesendorp and Zoe Zengelis in the mid-1970s. But we're particularly talking about the series of competitions and uh, large buildings which they designed in the late 1980s, largely at a point when the latter three part- original partners had all left. Cool House was uh, left as the only one remaining. Quite some time ago, you told me that these competitions were some of the best things that anyone had ever designed. They're some of my favourite projects, yeah. I think that they're really interesting. There's obviously an implied question there, but it's not one that I'm going to answer. I imagine most people listening to the podcast already have some familiarity with Cool House. I had, I've, I had very little. We'd done, we'd done an episode on him before, and in spite of having been to lectures by him and him being this like colossus in the time of our education. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to try and sum up what it's about, um, OMA comes into being in in 1975, and they are this fascinating, critical, provocative presence within architectural culture. In a sense, they're kind of riding the wave of the crisis of modernist collapse, but they're simultaneously positioning themselves against all the main tendencies of postmodernism, postmodern and other, and reaction. Early on, their project is... Uh, described by by Koolhaas almost a, as a sort of rearguard action on behalf of the values of modern of modernity against the reactionary scenarios of various resuscitators of the past, from Leon Creer on one hand to Aldo van Eyck on the other. The OMA project is to continue the process of modernisation while leaving orthodox modernism and the dead end of postmodernism. Uh, in the past. It looks for a new version of modernity partly excavated from New York, the study, the subject of a famous uh, study which they published in the late 1970s, partly also in Russian constructivism, which we'll talk about, and it's all animated by a kind of hedonistic delight in the possibilities of architecture and a subversive erudition capable of turning the discoveries and models of the past towards its own purposes. Uh, We said it already, but in this episode, we're focusing on a particular transitional moment, which is where the early paper projects are replaced by real buildings, propositions and large scale competition entries, culminating in the five competitions which they entered in 1989, at least three of which I think merit a really close examination. And we're also going to talk about the presentation of those projects in OMA's legendary monograph SMLXL, released in the mid-90s, which also contains the essay Bigness, this moment where where Kulhas tries to give theoretical form to the approach that we're going to see developing in these various projects. You've heard of Rem Kulhas, but what is it? He's born in the Netherlands at the end of the war during the Dutch famine, and obviously in a devastated country. His father is a playwright and journalist and screenwriter. They're clearly an intellectual family because he has relatives who are also architects and these kind of, you know, uncles and things. Yes, yeah, like intellectual aristocracy. But not sort of like, not mega wealthy or anything. Um, his father was a big supporter of decolonialisation. So the first thing the Dutch government did after the war was desperately try to get control of its limited and scattered former colonies. Everyone everyone was doing it. <laughs> yeah, it really, was, it really yeah. was sort of as soon as they could get anything together. After that, he was invited by the newly independent government of Indonesia to do a number of projects to do with you know writing up writing up the transition so they moved to indonesia for i think four years in the in the in the early 50s which would be you know when he's sort of seven to 
11 or something. He said he lived, it was amazing. I really lived like the Asians. As an Asian. As an Asian. As an Asian, yeah. As an Asian. Uh, and I think that the sort of massive sprawling cities and the potential of the growth of this different uh, society, as well as the cultural juxtaposition from this wrecked, bombed out, like things that you have a different scope of possibilities in a wrecked country, which has to be, which was the sort of Netherlands of his youth. And then this cultural transition. And I think the idea of the next great explosion of cities is going to go to another scale, probably in Asia. Um, and the idea of the, the mega city is another influence, I think, on his thought. Yeah. and that, As well as the, the, the global culture. That becomes a big obsession. That's a sort of later period obsession, which comes in in the, I guess, sort of from the late 90s onwards, really, in yeah. in, in Oma. But I think there's bits yeah, of it... There are bits of it in the in SNL here, as well. And I think, actually, even in some of the ideas of Delirious New York, actually... I think there's a connection between this this great confluence that he loves. Yeah. This density. If, if there's one thing that he loves, it's density. Density and diversity in place. Uh, he didn't go into architecture until his mid-20s. So he spent the early 20s doing various jobs working in journalism. He also wrote these a couple of film scripts. Uh, the, which well, one, are, one of which was made. Well, yeah. One called The White Slave, which is a sort of exploitation kind of noir and then in in uh, when he was 24 he went to the architectural association in london which was beginning in 1968 so that kind of great year of not quite revolutions in doing so he sort of entered a very central institution in architectural culture during a particular period when it was very much the heart of of quite a kind of vital scene Amazingly vital and also pretty avant-garde, I'd say. Yeah, so Archi Archi Archigram had been there during the 60s. Yeah, Cedric and... Price. There's a lot of there's a lot of kind of high utopian theory, I would say, going on, and kind of art, the very philosophical end of. Sure. Patents. Yeah. And very, but very, very vibrant, and um, it must have been terrifically exciting. You can see that he he like he had a pretty stellar academic career. You know, he's his thesis project. Uh, the Voluntary Prisoners of Architecture, which he did in, the in I think, 72, is one of the, like, famous sort of critical utopian projects of that era. It's, it's widely published, uh, which is kind of a, an unusual thing for a student project. And it also emerged out of a study trip and an essay which he'd written about the Berlin Wall as architecture, yeah. which I think reveals something very important about Kulhas, which is... I guess it kind of comes across as maybe as a sort of slight sort of amorality, but there is um, an interest in retaining a kind of sort of neutral posture and of observing quite closely these phenomena, which it would sort of seem to be impossible to not reach an, an ethical judgment about. I'd, I'd say there's a real journalistic, slightly tabloidy journalistic delight in confronting critical norms as well yeah well there's, icon which is, there's iconoclasm which, there's I'm an iconoclasm sure. in the aa at that time in general and it's an era of cultural iconoclasm and i think um all the way through his is always wanting to confront it's interesting the people that he chooses to oppose himself to and one of the ones that he really hates is aldo van eyck and i think that a lot of what he's trying to confront often is a sort of slightly soft slightly kind of mystically tinged uh humane uh, architectural rhetoric which for him presents something which is actually impossible to achieve and which is really a kind of a lie and i think i think that he regards this kind of sort of humane this kind of humanist prospectus on architecture which is offered by van eyck and others as hypocritical in a sense there's there's certainly some of that, but I think there's also just he delights in he's got a real delight in a certain sort of story. It's slightly yeah. transgressive, slightly possibly prurient. Prurient in what sense? Or or perhaps that like the gaze on the gaze on filth <laughs> or mess or things that people find or he calls it sort of low or 
challenging or something. Which in particular? Several things. Well, the the political act of like, you know, the, the voluntary prisons of architecture has got sort of, you know, this notion of everyone being very happy or it it kind of posits a sort of critical dystopia of dividing up London or any city into into sort of wall zones which you have to kind of like debase yourself and beg to get across. Yeah, and then it creates this strange sort of paradise in the but in the middle of the wall. The wall actually expands to something which contains a building scale volume. And then it has this I mean it's like a kind of classic student project in that it has a sequential narrative of different sorts of experiences which are which are there. Yeah, and it also has this quite kind of amoral. For example, he includes like loads of where he includes, what does he have that's apropos of not much random, like, sort of porny images and pictures of... Yeah, all sorts of detritus and um, things. Which he regards as important. Yes, but I think that it's ro- I think that the tabloid comment is slightly the wrong one. I don't think it's tabloid in intent. I think he delights in that quality, though. Because that's not that's moralistic, and the whole point is that it's not moralistic. Yeah. It's deliberately well, amoral. I mean, per- like, yeah. th- that, like, the idea of a kind of tabloid view on these things is that it's profoundly, like... Like moralistic and outraged in an old fashioned uh, way. Perhaps I'm using the words not well, but the sentiment of enjoy, the appreciate, what there is a way of appreciating that sort of media, which is to do with just liking the kind of liking the hypocrisy, transaction, vulgarity, contradiction of that sort of discourse. He very quickly starts teaching at the AA, I think, with his, um, with Zengelis, who, who had been his teacher. Then there is this series of research projects which happened during the late seventies, all which are important for yeah they're they're the place where uh, a lot of these ideas about buildings form. So the more famous one of them is going to America and coming up with this project which becomes Delirious New York, which is termed a retroactive manifesto for Manhattan. What interests him is that New York is clearly this incredibly modern it's like one of them is one of the most modern cities it, during the modern period it's yeah. the most modern city but it's also it doesn't seem to have an explicit ideology of what it's trying to create because it kind of emerges it's it's incredibly distinctive it has a really clear urban form um and uh you know it has very very distinct qualities but it's very short on on kind of theory that's where the retroactive manifesto kind of idea comes from it's the, it's the idea of writing more or less seriously what the yeah what the kind of principles of of um, manhattanism would have been uh, there's a quote which i really like which i think is worth reading out in smlxl is like written across the reproduced some of the reproduced pages of delirious new york which goes like this it says the permanence of even the most frivolous item of architecture and the instability of the metropolis are incompatible. In this conflict, the metropolis is, by definition, the victor. In its pervasive reality, architecture is reduced to the status of a plaything, tolerated as decor for the illusions of history and memory. In Manhattan, this paradox is resolved in a brilliant way through the development of a mutant architecture that combines the aura of monumentality with the performance of instability. Its interiors accommodate compositions of program and activity that change constantly and independently of each other without affecting what is called, with accidental profundity, the envelope. The genius of Manhattan is the simplicity of this divorce between appearance and performance. It keeps the illusion of architecture intact while surrendering wholeheartedly to the needs of the metropolis. This architecture relates to the forces of the Großstadt like a surfer to the waves. There's a kind of difficulty, right? <clears throat> Which is, at times, like in New York, it seems, in Delirious New York, it seems to me that he is suggesting that what's so good about it is, or not what's so good about it, but at its core, it's untheorized, unintentional, um, like collectively done. You know, these things are cool because no no one's decided that we're going to... Like, you've got interchangeable facades with totally different things going on behind them in these super big things. That's all kind of evolved in the the thesis. And then that 
the architects, what's the role of the architect, is, is very different. <laughs> His interpretation of the role of the architect, I think, is very different to the limited agency of the architect we had with Adam uh, uh, Caruso Sinjin. Um, I think it's like the opposite. His, I think his is that like you're in this sea of like massive powers in the city, you know, this huge, it's going to swallow you up um, <laughs> sort of city with massive density and great movements of capital, power, thought, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that somehow in that you can kind of grab hold of the coattails and encapsulate this density, encapsulate and is, yeah. But, 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 but it's something which I don't think he thinks architects have done knowingly heretofore. In New York, no. Accidental, yeah. Uh, but he finds, he obviously is finding it in particular historic projects. The other, I mean, the other one, I think not really as published, but there's a good lecture which he does about it which is on the AA website is that he did a lot of research into early Soviet constructivist avant-garde and in particular there's a couple of figures he got very interested in which are Ivan uh, Leonidov and uh, Yakov Chernikov and then also a little bit Moshe, Moshe Ginsberg who we talked about on our episode on the palace of the soviets and their lecture is really is it's very short they haven't recorded the whole thing but it's still really worth they've got an amazing archive of stuff but it's all very dependent on the person not like turning over the tape at the wrong moment <laughs> yeah, or like yeah, yeah. pressing play as in that one he's talking about um the plans which these various avant-garde's had for uh, magnitohorsk which is the big uh, planned soviet industrial city and which went through different stages there's a later stage where it was taken over by western european avant-garde's who had a much more orthodox sort of international style kind of approach to it uh, he's looking at these proposals from leonidov and ginsburg which are these quite interesting they're sort of hypothetical housing and living and leisure types he has a really nice i might drop this in actually he has a really nice analysis of uh, a gymnasium He's really interested in the geometric abstraction of the plans, the way in which they, they're able so fluently to kind of move towards a nevertheless still legible sort of abstraction in terms of the plans. He's also really, you can see him homing in on this moment where the um, you've got the changing room and you have this moment where it's sort of suggested that you get little glimpses from the male changing room into the female changing room and vice versa. And this, this, these moments of kind of mixing and proximity and a kind of a frisson, yeah, sexu yeah. sexuality, kind of the, the erotic, the, and the, like hedonism. I mean, I think that one of the things which Coolhouse is definitely trying to bring back into architecture is a sense that it might be something which creates pleasure. Yeah, a particular sort of pleasure he really likes. He loves the pleasure of like casinos. Yeah, there's a famous there's a famous bit in Delirious New York where he does this funny speculative analysis of a, a plan showing the different things you can have on the floor of a skyscraper where there's like a, a locker room and a sort of athletics club and then there's a bit where there's an oyster bar and then there's a space in between them and he has this hypothesis that that's the place where you go to eat oysters naked wearing boxing gloves and there's a Madelon Friesendorp I think did a painting depicting exactly this scene which is quite in a, in a kind of sort of Soviet realist style which is quite a famous image um, and yeah I think that that's kind of yeah and the constructivists are part of this right at the beginning of the Soviet Union and before it there's this kind of euphoric delirious you know there's the counterpoint to all the like weighty marxism there's this like it's going to be like the crowd is going to become ecstatic and it's going to be a colored vivid paradise you know spirits fused in ecstasy kind of kind of idea of what um communism is going to be like like he's super drawn to the dense city with its anonymity proximity density it loves all the things piled on top of each other all of this massive activity like anti-suburban yeah you know? yeah absolutely anti-suburban but also anti the politeness and the the kind of blandness of mega structural modernism you know the kind of the rather the elegant but rather empty 
you know, plazas and walkways of the Barbican Centre or whatever. That's not what we're about here. Yeah, well, he's seen that the mega structures don't work, which basically people did right away. I mean, it didn't mean that people stopped doing them right away because they're jolly good fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd love to do one. But people quite quickly realised, oh, this doesn't really work. Uh, uh, this um, Tuscan Hill Village plonked in, plonked in like N17. Yeah, we need more donkeys. Uh, yeah. It's not quite, it seems remarkably windswept. I mean, I think we'll get on to the very different vision to the mega structure. It's kind of like the opposite, isn't it? Where the mega structure is like, we're going to take a village's worth of activities and incorporate it at high density through a number of repeating units. Yes, whereas he's not interested in villages. He's no. interested in the city. It's a vision of the city, isn't it? It's not the city on the hill. It's it's the it's the flesh, the flesh pots, isn't it? Yes, yeah, the but, flesh pots. Yeah. But also sort of, he's into thrills and culture, but I think there's also a notion of sort of like economic dynamism of people piled in at high density in an implausible way. Yeah, the way he distinguishes himself from all of the other critics of modernism is that where they propose to, you know, to reclaim or to like re to resurrect some concept of the public realm as this sort of place charged with meaning uh, with a kind of communication, also at working at a certain scale, uh, with a certain kind of re- yeah. interrelation. And he says very clearly that we need to stop pretending that that's possible. It's not possible I mean, to get this back. He's super into the, uh, a notion of the public realm. It's just a very different one. His would include like the inside of high speed trains. The like the agora is not is not the delightful shopping street. It is the plane, the airport concourse. With like tons of crappy whiskey concessions and 24 hour capsule hotels and whatever. So, we're going to take a quick break and tell you about our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Very important to have the plus. George, what's The Great Courses? It's a Exactly. Streaming learning service. It's a streaming learning service. Um, oh god, today you better do it because you actually <laughs> re- remember all the forms of words. I'm it's a str- to... it's a streaming learning service on which you can watch videos of lectures, thousands of them, literally thousands, by experts, people uh, who actually know what they're talking about. Literally thousands of them on topics like world history, archaeology, astronomy, art and literature, cooking, learning a new language. Uh, all sorts of useful professional skills. Law. What to do when you get sued. Yeah. It'll happen sooner or later. Yeah. All... Uh, for those of you working in architecture anyway. They're all presented by top-notch experts who are extremely well-informed and who are extremely good teachers. And that's the case with the, uh, with the course which I've been watching this month, The Architecture of Power, Great Palaces of the Ancient World. Uh, to pick out an episode in particular, which I've really enjoyed, is the one on the Villa Adriana, Hadrian's Villa. Which is one of the best buildings. Yeah, which is an extraordinary uh, building which he locates you know, within this revolution in Roman architecture and architectural technology both kind of spatial symbolic uh, but also like structural innovations so in particular this use of the of um, what he what they're called pumpkin do- domes these ribbed domes um, well they were getting fancier and fancier weren't yeah they? so there's they're pretty amazing i mean the thing that's amazing about it it's got so many one level it's this amazing collage of his of like sort of technologically reinterpreted um, buildings from other places, but kind of viewed through fantasy. It's this extraordinary. It's not at all a kind of grand palace expression of power. It's like this sort of succession of wonder worlds. There's the the great famous theater, which is a the maritime theater theater with a lake in the middle, and on the island is a an, an, in the lake is an island with the hut on the island in the theater, in which. Hadrian can write. There are lots of different ideas about what it was for. Yeah, with, uh, um, but uh, but uh, and other there's there's sort of copies of other palaces um, or temples or temples. these other. Yeah, yes, it's all it's very absorbing. Look and, at the plan; it's amazing. Yeah, it was very 
nice to encounter this uh, this kind of explanation of how they would have been used originally, since they're now so often encountered as ruins or as um, these representations by um, yeah, and later artists. Yeah, and kind of reinterpretations, yeah. right? And it's all like that. So I kind of think that at least some of you might be interested in finding out for yourselves. If that is the case, then hold your horses just for a second because we have a, sp a special offer, which is time-limited a full free month of unlimited access to the entire library. So you could get the whole of that course done. Yeah. It's you got could. some good buildings. It has got some good buildings, yeah. Well, we'll and I think I might talk about some more of them later in the later in the month. If you are interested in that, you need to sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. Thanks very much for sponsoring our show. We're nearly at the uh, main buildings that we need to talk about. I just want to give a quick overview. So there are some the early competitions. The first competitions that they do are in 1978, they entered the Dutch Parliament competition. And I think they were placed joint first, but didn't win they built someone else's ski. Yeah, it may not have been the most practical proposal, but it was pretty cool. That that competition was an interesting little um, footnote to that is that Zaha Hadid was their collaborator. She had been a Cool Hass's student, I think, and is like a couple of years younger than him. They also did the competition for the Irish Premier's house, the Taoiseach's house, which I think Zaha then entered on her own with a different with her, like, her own um, entry well, for... You can sort of see how they're compatible in the early kind of constructivist Zaha period. These ones draw pretty strongly on a kind of quite sort of fragmented formal language. that they're, they're made up of these, these different elements which are thrown together so that in the Dutch Parliament competition, well, they're trying to pull together this site which is already made up of lots of different historic periods and layers and accretions and that's very much foregrounded in the text that they write to explain it and it has, you know, a bit which is a leftover bit of land just extruded straight up into a skyscraper. There's this long linear floating corridor. There's a sort of floating cloister which is at a very high level uh, and there are sort of these very, all these forms come together. There's a bit which is referred to in the plans as the guitar because it sort of looks like a guitar. Yeah, I mean the key thing is these ones are sort of they're geometric and they're also they also sort of make real abstractions. If that I means something like like you know they just kind of represent the the you know, the offices is a tower boom in that place um, and it kind of is working off. And then they all, yeah, so they're, they're different. In a way, they, they each different bit is its own form, but the way that they collide with each other is very important. And, it's, uh, and then for the Taoiseach's house, it's a funny programme because it has to contain a private house for the individual, a series of public, I mean, speaking of the White House, kind of public function rooms, and then also a series of places for guests to stay. And the way that those are reconciled in the programme is that there's a, like, rectangle, which is all the guest rooms looking out, out into a courtyard. And then there, are, um, there is a line which comes off that in a curve. And then there's another curve which intersects the curve and the two collide and one leaps over the other. And those create the, the relation of the three different programs. But you can see they're almost like those kind of constructivist architecton abstract sculptures. And it's literally, I mean, it, it's taking building components, making them into shapes, and the, the 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 diagram is kind of the building. There's no and those uh, th they have a particular way of representing the projects at that time, which is that they are uh, kind of exploded cavalier projection. So they're they're axonometrics, but they're axonometrics which are going back from the facade. Yeah. So they have this str strange, yeah. slightly canted. Feel I would say all the way through, he's been very fond of uh, representations which are. Uh, highly artificial and then also they have they selectively delete lots of walls so that you can see everything that's going on but also so that you really lose 
the sense of what the building would actually be like all the way through like it, eventually it sort of changes due to the necessities of photo renders but uh like until that hits he's still he's pretty wedded to these to forms of representation which abstract a lot uh they do a couple of other ones which we don't need to talk about they do an entry for the famous la villette competition which was won by bernard schumi in the early 80s to say about it and then there's an important one which is the they do a competition entry for the city hall for the hague which is this strange proposal which is like an enormous city block like a super block very tall and which reads as being made out of lots of cuboidal kind of skyscrapers which have been rammed together kind of stuck together into this big hole and, and they'll which kind is, of they'll kind of do something pretty like that later they uh, they do eventually murder all the classics and you can see in all of those these theoretical preoccupations are coming in and then uh, zengelis left in 1987 because of sort of irreconcilable differences of personality i think something else which is that he always sort of stands a distance to himself at first i thought it's that there was a distance he sort of stood put a distance between his theory and his practice but actually i think the difference is he has a distance between his work and himself <laughs> like he just he's prepared to wryly comment on the things he's done and that it's that's the sense i mean i think that that's true and that's the sense in which he's a deconstructivist you know, in the sense that 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 movement was kind of identified for lots of those people, what they did was they were interested in a, a sort of formal approach, which is about fragmentation or or a kind of deconstruction is movement. kind of is kind of more. If you're coming at postmodernism from a discipline other than architecture, deconstruction is more postmod, much more postmodern than postmodern architecture. It's kind of they create a narrative about process by which the building is created or the design is made. Yeah, so we've got like Eisenman with process design sort of stuff. Yeah, where 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 there's this sort of presentation of almost a development. You know, all the cubes kind of fly together. You've got like Liebskin with whatever it is that he does, which is <laughs> these kind of strange John Cage musical scores. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, <laughs> oh um, and then you have Zaha, which is presented as coming out of drawing, yeah. although in practice, I think it was much more dialogic than that. I think she kind of veers a little bit further away from the group. Yeah, sure. In, um, the, in the methods, but I think that's the sense in which Kulhas is de is deconstructivist in the sense that that critical reflection on he, he kind of says as much his as own well. process he kind of says sort he of kind distance of, from it he acknowledges himself as being part of uh deconstructivist talking what's different about him is that the process has way more integrity and is way more interesting than that it is with those like with all of those people it often produces a, quite an interesting resolution but if you like push into what the process is about there's not very much to talk about it Whereas in Kulhas, the layers of really interesting stuff. Well, what's different about the, the the designs we're going to talk about is that he's got something which actually addresses where the design is actually in some sense responding to what the building is for. Whereas a lot of those are like are like shape methods, aren't they? Like Eisenman, Liebskin, to to a pretty large extent, Z Zaha, they are producing shape generation tools. I think his is a bit more than that well, <laughs> it's got something else going on <laughs> well let's see how so so 1989 yeah we're gonna do zeebrugger first yeah so let's talk zeebrugger to stay viable after the opening of the tunnel between england and the continent the ferry companies operating across the channel proposed to make the crossing more exciting not only would the boats turn into floating entertainment worlds but their destinations the terminals would shed their utilitarian character and become attractions. And so that's that's basically the prospectus for this ferry terminal, which is at Zeebrugge in Belgium. So there was there was a little sort of Belgian Riviera in the 30s, which would be like Nock, or was it Nocker? And they had loads of casino. It was a sort of it's kind of it's kind of bleak as a landscape. It's sort of whites and greys. So you've got flat. an amazing tram that runs all the way along for like a hundred miles along the along coast. the coast. Yeah, and it was and a sort of a place where um, English people would like let their hair down. It was a bit more um, permissive. Yeah, and there were loads of casinos. It's kind of more accessible than a dirty weekend in Paris due to the proximity, I guess, back in the day. But serving that sort of slightly dissolute well-off market for English people to let their hair down. That really fell on hard times at the, the dawn of, like, being able to fly places. I guess it was the sort of upper-middle-class equivalent of the resort towns in England that all fell away with package tours. Yeah, although I think the Belgians still go there. 
And oh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that they've held on better than a lot of the seaside towns did here. I guess this competition was in that context, right? Yeah. In the presentation in SML XL, it's got this fantastic little concept sketch, which is Bruegel's famous painting of the Tower of Babel turned upside down. And yeah. the, 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 the concept is called a working Babel. So it's this idea of the terminal as this place of incredible mixing of people from and on and of different programs from everywhere and, ev- and, and anywhere. And we're going to see the beginnings of what, it, what this sort of big building is going to be, yeah. that he's going to do. Um, what the building looks like is it's in the water with roads going to it. And it looks like a giant, well, I guess it's like, you know, those things that you have on the, on the, the side of the quay for tying up your ship to. Like a big bulbous, like bollard is what it sort of looks like. White, several stories tall. How many? Like ten or something. I mean, essentially like twenty. Twenty. But some of them, are, some of them are like multi-height spaces, and those aren't all inhabitable. Some of them are these parking, yeah. spiraling parking and uh, transport spaces. It's like a, it's like an upside down cone, but then the top of it turns into a kind of a bulb. Dome. Yeah, bulb in the water. And the way it appears is that it's a solid white thing pierced with holes, but then the top of it has been sliced and replaced with a glass. So that it, so it becomes glass above this cut line. And the the excitement of the um the car and uh lorry circulation is really maximized with these ser- sort of serpentine motorway cloverleaf kind of um bridges which all zoom into the middle of it and uh, kind of weave around. And the project is essentially the bottom is where the furries dock, lorries and cars get off and people, and there are various ways in which they get to the land on complicated mesh of bridges. And then above that, there's parking in sort of spirals. And then above that, there's like offices on one side with a big atrium down the middle and a hotel on the other side essentially the hotel's got like a casino and a jollification and thrills activities all in a big pile on the top of the kind of utile you know practical bit at the bottom yeah and the idea is that the program is kind of spiraling upwards a bit like the tower of babel spirals yeah. upwards but the but spiraling outward rather than inward as the famous babel does um and the real focus of interest is in the center of this very deep circular plan there are holes or cuts through and so that you're sometimes it's arranged like a donut where you're kind of going up and round in a spiral sometimes there's like a like a half on one side and a half on the other side and then a gap in the middle with escalators and bridges dramatically jutting across yeah. the the void through the, the the projects we're going to see, they're all going to have different variations on the kind of active void in the middle, where he sort of said that the facade can be generic, but you're going to have these different things go on inside. And in a way, the centre replaces the facade, where you have this section through all these different activities with circulation crisscrossing it and being a kind of active place. And another thing I think with the terminal is that it's a stack of plans which have all got this really great graphical quality of like geometric geometrically divided function in a sort of physical diagram kind of way yeah if you look at some of the plans you'll see these like bits of furniture or bars or toilet blocks or whatever which are distributed within these geometrical shapes but in a way which is exactly it's kind of graphically considered isn't it it's a stack of really different things which creates when you would kind of be at the bottom of the void looking up you'd see all of this different stuff and the different shapes would allude to different uses and the different things that are going on there and then there's a joy in making the circulation as complicated as possible and as arbitrary as possible which is a sort of delight in Pyrenaean quality of like things jutting and crossing and those are the moments of intensification aren't they this and in a way the intensification is again it's another diagram made real it's like you've got this intense hub of activity and diverse uses and that is sort of represented by visual intensity stuff is not orderly and tidy it's it's strong striking and contrasting in different ways as it goes up whereas on the outside it's all one simple light bulb light bulb 
on the inside, all of these different shapes are clashing and crashing into each other. They're kind of, yeah, they're held together. So if you look, there's a nice model which they made. And if you look at the top of it, you see there's a sort of silver part of it, which is the entertainment part. And then there's a, um, a kind of roof garden, which you reach across these two dramatic bridges. And those two are being prized apart by this black building which is like a mini building inside the building which pushes up and which has a swimming pool dramatically on its roof but out of sight of everyone else it's kind of, this is kind of like a swank service station basically isn't it but so massive it's very cool it's extremely cool and then it has this moment of real drama which is that there's also been a stripe across its belly has kind of been deleted as it were and replaced with a dramatic steel truss running all the way around so you can see all the way through it through this zigzag truss shape something that characterized this period is that they had a team from arab working inside the office on the competitions on the basis that they were participating in the competition to, in an attempt to get the fees as well you know rather than as um so there's, there's a there's a resident team um and there's a real structural engagement i don't think we need to talk about it too much in this one because it's this is not the one where it's most interesting what's interesting about this one is there's a difficult decision to be made about what type of structure it is yeah. and that it is either a sprayed concrete structure so that it's something which is actually quite lightweight and which which is just about creating an appearance and a sort of appearance of solidity or it's a reinforced concrete structure in which case it's sort of massive and the structure is actually carried in the mass that you see and the difference between those you know these have all, there are all kinds it of differences makes it in terms into a of, joke almost yeah that there are sort of two versions of the building there's elements of this competition which are not entirely serious and one of them is this proposal which is where you could have 12 people building it for 40 years the top or you could have tons of people just erecting, quickly erecting a steel frame and then hanging chicken wire on it and then like spraying concrete from boats <laughs> sort of thing. Neither proposed, I think, would be, was, was entirely serious. But that, that is sort of the dilemma which is posed by the structural design of this yeah. building, which and the different strategies lead to very different sorts of results yeah. in the end. It's, it's very cool. It's extremely nice, yeah. If you just look up a picture of the model, it's bigger than it seems. And also, because the, there's a bit of a lorry in it, which is out of scale. It's like they just bought a dinky toy of a lorry <laughs> and just put it in the photograph. That's it, a big old lorry. It, it's like three stories tall. Yeah, yeah. it's a lorry that appears to be something like nine metres tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not sure about that one. What did they build in the end? Any idea? I think that they just didn't do it. Do it because, I mean, I think actually it ended up that, well, for one thing, the Channel Tunnel took a lot longer to make than that and also it didn't really hurt the ferry trade that much I, it's a delightful it's a delightful proposition this one um a lot of fun um and i think that w just to make a point about those plans and this is something we'll see in others as well but th that that kind of geometrical abstraction in the plans is coming out of russian constructivism it's coming out of uh, leonidov and it's an abstract diagrammatization really so you've got the activities and an activity takes place in a geometric form which is related to yeah. its use and then the connections are also geometrically represented yeah. so i think i think that's a key more than just it being abstract that's the, the kind of category of abstraction that's going on okay so should we talk about tgb yeah tregon bibliothèque it's, this is in the context of um, Mitterrand. Uh, this is a great age of strident, slightly megalomaniacal leaders of the Western democracies. Yeah. So Mitterrand had come in as a socialist, as the socialist president in eighty two, I think, and he had initially attempted to do quite radical things with the economy, like nationalise all the banks and this kind of thing, and had then been quite sternly disciplined by the international financial markets and had been forced to change tack a bit. And I think that the they're called they're just called like the Grand Projet, aren't they? These yeah. these like big cultural and infrastructural works which he commissioned instead, I think become an attempt to do at symbolic level things which he turned out to be unable to stick at in on the economic level. I mean, in that yeah, in that sense, it's kind of monumental propaganda in the, yeah, yeah. In the, the sort and, of Soviet there's sense. There's a whole series of them. I can't remember. There's like, and I think this one is quite late. So in the context of, so there's, there'd been the huge arch, 
which is this sort of like tesseract shadow. Something in in La Défense. There's Opera Bastille. Yeah. A very bad and very large opera house. They really mucked up the competition on that one. This one's a real dog. Très Grand Bibliothèque is a replacement for the National Library. So, yeah, they didn't win this competition. The, it's actually built by... Is it Dominique Perrault, the one... I don't know. I know what the building's like. It's, um... The the building is like a is like as big as a mediocrity can be, I'd say. And they only sort of finished moving out the library in like two thousand and maybe two thousand and six or something. They finished. They they really they did. They made the switch. I mean, it's much hated by scholars. The uh, or at least certainly the old guard. It's a much less good building than the old building. As buildings, the old building is a five star building. This is a mediocrity on a massive scale, though. It has. It's quite funny because it's sort of desperately trying to be super monumental is the one with like four chamfer shaped towers on the corners isn't it yeah basically side. yeah which are storage like gold like gold glass and then and then a big plinth building in the middle of all of which uniting them the books have got great views yeah it's quite weird i don't know <laughs> <clears throat> this is where i think cool and cool is sort of erudition and his interest in history makes this project really charged and interesting and in sml excel the image which they show is the famous one of etienne louis uh, boulet's proposal for a national library which is this this great sort of piece of paper architecture from the french revolutionary period this is very kind of consciously the late 18th century architecture of the enlightenment and of this kind of universalist idea of... Again, diagrammatic abstraction and ma- mega scale. Yeah, and the sort of monumentality of these these like vaunting universal ambitions, bringing together all of the world's knowledge in one place and keeping it safe and making it available. And in, in the Boulet scheme, obviously, that's presented through something which is in the language of classicism, so... Yeah, me- well, ne- megalomaniacal neoclassicism. Yeah, sure, like very rational classicism. And it's quite different, a cool house proposal. Well, it's totally different, but the but the connections between them are really productive. So the competition had called for it to be low with towers, which is in fact what eventually won. And the, the competition criteria is this is going to be a, a universal 21st century library. It's going to be full of, you know, audiovisual laboratories and uh, <laughs> and the video and uh, cinema library and the image library are going to be on equal footing with the book library. In, in essence, it's actually going to be a sequence of institutions. And some of the proposals have the institutions kind of separately, in separate towers, for example. And so he'd had said, well, we're going to have a tower of stacks and then somehow connect a load of different external things, which will be these different cultural functions in a kind of various different ways one of which is it's like this sort of like zigzag going down the building um linking together the functions there's a realization that some are kind of popular and some are academic and so that that some some are more remote and some are more attached so the cinemas are deemed to be super popular and they're connected like that and then there's the sort of big innovation which is you can just defy the program, put everything in a huge box, a massive cube raised off the ground. Is it like a 100 meter cube? It's a yes, it's a 100 by 100 by 100 meter cube, which is which is kind of filled isotropically with like book and archive storage, except for these areas which are subtracted from it. Yeah, which are there's sort of various, there's various attempts at the thing. And then it ends up with the scheme, which is the key innovation of the scheme is, yes, you start by designing a building which is just storage, a cube full of storage, and then you say, we've got a set of objects we need to insert into it, and you just insert them as voids. And the sort of function, the diagrammatic function of the object defines where it goes. So on at the bottom, you've got cinemas in the middle, because cinemas need to be in the dark. Like some, I think the video labs are like smash up against the side and you sort of see them protruding onto the facade. So you've got this grid facade and then suddenly it's changed. The surface of the cube is changed by being part video lab. And there are various things and there are various iterations of what the shapes will be. And he realises that, well, 
the shapes are voids, so they can be anything. And that means you, you develop this collection of strange shaped voids. So um, a loop de loop on the top. What, yeah, yeah, what yeah. is the loop de loop? I don't know what the loop de loop like is. There's a loop de loop. There's like an auger tip, you know, like one of these sort of spirals, like like a helical screw, but really, really stretched wide, which is the reference library. And the idea is that this screw is like connecting to all the book stacks and like little research things. And it's just literally this continuously sloping floor it would have been really weird. Yeah. It would <laughs> like he never represents. I've never seen a representation of the interiors of any of these spaces. They're not. And in fact, the representations are all, everything that is solid is not there and everything that is void is there. That's the standard representation, which is really not a good idea of gauging what it would be like. Yeah, no, the the classic presentation of these two models, one which is where all the voids have been made solid and you just see them floating in space and you see the lift shafts, which are a grid. And the other one is, yeah, the as all the book stacks are just solid mass and you just see the various holes poking into it in, yeah. in different places. Yeah, the kind of rhetorical presentation of this is is strategy of the void, which in SMLXL is illustrated with a piece of Japanese pornography. Which, uh, in which yes, <laughs> in famously... Japan it is illegal to represent genitals. And so uh, from a pornographic picture, they have cut the genitals out but <laughs> left everything else in, yeah. everything else present. Which is just the sort of joke he likes. It's yes, completely, it <laughs> it's completely just there to be provocative, really, because there is no, yeah, there's no, no just there's nothing in that picture which is actually applying to the building other than there's a hole. Yeah, there's like it's all about what's missing. Yeah, it's all about what's missing. The missing thing is the central thing, but that's just a joke. The other thing, which is that they have these quite early computer renders, which of them which are done, which are quite cool as well, with these very yeah, yeah. low like, low poly forms like floating box in the air with bullets, drill, loop de loop, and collection of fruit yeah. Yeah. floating in air, uh, all in extraordinarily low um, low poly surfaces. So, for one thing, it has a really interesting relationship to that tradition of. Uh, French like rational neoclassicism because it's about the relationship between space and solid like figure and ground um, in the classic uh, sort of poche mode of uh, looking at the plan you're making a very clear hierarchical distinction between spaces which are containers of of like meaningful program and this other black area which is ambiguously structural and service and so this is absolutely i mean the strategy of the void in a sense is like an adaptation of a previously existing neoclassical way of planning but it's just taken into this total parallel universe that's one of the things which i think is you know the, the self-conscious way that Kulhas relates to his own process i think here you see the possibility of that that there is something very very productive which is coming out of that 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 like experimental engagement with different sorts of design process there's this idea of this cube of slats and weird shapes in it the shapes the interiors of the shapes are never really drawn out and then there's images of the exterior of it which is sort of you know wobbles meeting cube and what happens next is that they develop the sort of structural system for the building yeah. which is an interesting act because it's kind of like the building at the mo at the, at the start is like a metaphor almost mm. it's like it's extremely gestural the rooms are just blobs yeah in essence and i don't know but because i haven't seen the brief but i think that that might be appropriate in a sense like it may well be that the brief asks for something which is capable of accommodating these sorts of things but without defining in any great detail what they actually are and to be you know it can be a brief which is much more about a strategy sure but they're literally blobs but they're capable they're certainly capable of accommodating sure all forms. sorts of you different things, things yeah. in them yeah but they're not drawn beyond the level of blobs but the building is kind of technologically resolved to a degree yeah well they they present as the kind of problem what it would be to do this building as like a concrete frame and the problem would be that the columns would start off quite small at the top but by the time they got to the bottom they would have to become enormously thick doing it in a sort of orthodox way and so you would end up with this very strange 
condition at the ground level where it would be mostly column and you'd sort of be moving between these enormous tree trunks. Yeah, so what they do is make a series of 100 by 100 metre walls, concrete, inserted at 12 metre intervals through the building. And I presume the half metre is taken up with just the thickness of the wall and, and bracing walls going the other way. And that gives it sufficient rigidity that the building holds together and can accommodate these massive voids cut into it, which just go through the walls. They just cut. So you get this huge, effectively huge beams, which you can kind of castellate with these massive voids going through the space. And that gives it sufficient strength. And that's the sort of strategy. Oh, and on one side, there's like a tower of offices, which is sort of one edge of it. And um, is there a void between the tower of offices and the? There's like a tiny, there's a tiny gap which you could call of sort of sort of see up, and that's about the level that the project is developed to. It's an interesting project with the ferry terminal that shares the, the the key insight of you create a form which you don't really break very much. You have apertures in it, but it's essentially solid, and then you fill it, and then the the different activities are only revealed on the inside by these different shapes. In a way, they're not even revealed on the inside in this building because you never get to see the shapes. The only place you see them is where they contact with the facade. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's just an idea, isn't it? It's the... So it's sort of, it's a funny proposal because it seems, this seems of the ones we're going to look at by far the most paper architecture-y. I think it's worth dwelling how, on how strange the structural system is as well. It's quite an, it's quite an amazing thing to come up with. The walls would be 100 metres high and 100 metres wide and half a metre thick, like an enormous paper model or something, but blown up to this ludicrous yeah, size. but with huge holes cut through them. And then, and then wherever there are stacks, you would just be running some little joists across or something to support the floors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you just have holes in as, as you need to pass the books yeah. to and throw. Yeah. You just punch loads of holes in the walls. So there'd be a point in the construction where you'd have this huge wall and it'd have all these puncture holes in it and this huge hole cut out of it. And the building would be completely solid. There would be no ingress of light anywhere, natural light or natural air. It's a completely service building because it's full of walls, solid walls. And the things, the like loop-de-loop videotech lab buried in the middle somehow is kind of excavated through kind of mining out this solid... But which I think is, is appropriate for the... For the type, isn't it? I mean, the actually existing one has, is a series of glass skyscrapers which have to constantly have all the blinds down because they're yeah, storing yeah, it's, fra- it's, fragile it's totally paper fine. materials. I mean, the, 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 um, <laughs> the book stacks can be anything. They don't need to be there. They don't even need to be in the building. They can be just... Normally, they're basically buried or in a weird amalgam of tunnels and, you know, or in a crinkly tin shed, you know, um, very tall. You know, these huge, hugely tall shelves with robot, like with XY robots going to and through, picking up boxes off the shelves. It's better to have much bigger shapes to put the storage into because you really want it to be like an enormously tall warehouse in terms of the function of it. Um, But that doesn't really matter. I mean, the whole, the project in itself is a sort of funny thing to be building this new library on the edge of town at a time when full of video labs and cinemas in this nowhere. It's a weird idea. Why would you combine these things together? Why would you build it then? I mean, it's in Paris, but it's not in a, like, convenient location. It's actually quite near Ivry. Yes, scene of the previous episode. See, you know, with Renaudy, it's a sort of walking distance to that. I mean, probably probably a 15-minute walk. But Yeah, sure. But it, it, like, it's very much... The project is in contact in an interesting way with that history of like revolutionary architecture or with uh, you know versailles or with you know with these like absurd these like absurd mega projects in the past it's in a way which is very like sublimated but a way in which is not is that you never see you never see the building no 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 it's only revealed in it's necessary for the process to tell you the story because you wouldn't discern it in the building itself at least not in this case. Rem Kool has described SMLXL as a novel um, and talks about why it's not a monograph. And this is a sort of novelly project. This is a novel, not a building. Or, or this is a story, not a building. It's beyond the paper architecture of... I think it's a further abstraction from the constructivist ones or, or, the, or the French 
late 18th century paper architecture because it's one in which you do not see, you don't really see the building. I think it's a much better response to the brief than the one which they selected. Like, oh yeah, they, I would totally prefer they built it. I mean, it'd be much better. But that's, but, but isn't, but that's a bit of a low threshold because what they built is not good. It's not good, no. But but it, I it's mean, I, it's just, not, I'm just like push, I'm pushing much, against the, I'm pushing more interesting it, than something which is not at all no, good. But I'm pushing against the idea of it being of that's implied by paper architecture there. Like I think that it it's like a buildable like essentially a reasonable response to what's demanded by the albeit albeit very ingenious this is the building which they needed to build yeah (laughs) i i think it would have been the most fun one i think it would have been hated yeah possibly even more because it would have been kind of horrid to be in it would be like super mechanical everything would be weird like every bit of the floor in the in the in the reading room is sloping yeah i mean that's a bit of a weird one but there are like weird like the shapes are all really strange everywhere is miles and miles away from air and light it would be really i think it would be insanely cool and really weird and horrid (laughs) (laughs) okay so let's talk about zkm uh this is one which actually went into technical design um and it's a project cited in karlsruhe and it's uh, it's a real institution, the Centrum für Kunst und Medientechnologie. They did build one. Yeah, they did build one. It doesn't look like this. Uh, on a more modest, the budget was reduced, rather. And basically, a series of different cultural spaces of all kinds. It's got some things in common with the TGB. It's, it's enormously smaller. It's got, uh, you know, a lecture theatre, galleries, spaces for viewing different sorts of things. And it's, yeah, it's like a big box, basically. The story which is told about it in SML Excel starts with this idea of how to think about the relationship between the structure and the program in quite an interesting way. And he's very much thinking from the example of a previous effort in this kind of area, which is the Beauborg, now Pompidou Centre in Paris by um, Rogers and Piano. Uh, And in that building, the concept is that it's a building which is totally flexible in terms of its use and that that flexibility is achieved by two structural expedients one of which is famously all of the services and the circulation are moved from the inside of the building to the outside which creates this pattern of exciting pipes and staircases and lifts and things and the other is there are these very big floor plates which are supported by these uh, deep metal trusses which run all the way across and essentially allow the whole floor plate to have no columns at all so that the structure runs from one side of the building to the other and that supports everything and then the whole space inside is open to be used in whatever way you want in a way the concept is a bit of a failure because that turns out not to be very useful in a way institutions are the least the buildings that need to be least flexible because unlike say a block of flats or a factory it's unlikely to be turned into a block of flats or a factory but what it creates is something the visual quality is striking and you have these huge empty spaces which feel remarkably empty in the middle and in fact you have a big empty like lobby it doesn't feel Amazing, but it does feel like this. Well, it feels amazing because you come into Paris. It's sort of in Houseman Paris in a bomb zone, which has been kind of tidied up to a rectangle around it, like some sort of Greek temple. This extremely recti- recti- rectilinear, and it feels like a decorated shed, decorated by extremely by, by technological symbols. By technological symbols, yeah, it really is like that. The separation of function is something which it, which modernists and classicists and various people have been playing around with have a like a service tower next to the functional tower or you will interlace service floors so poche floors with active floors and so there's been this long complicated theoretical discussion of how of what you can separate things and the purpose of separating them is that you in the spaces which are thus freed of those encumbrances they can be pure or they can yeah. be the best version of themselves because they're not complicated or sullied or compromised this office can be the best rect best oblong office uh so in zkm they're building they're sort of very much starting from that kind of observation and the, the key observation is that these trusses in pompidou which support the floor plate 
floor plates, they have to become so deep in order to span that distance that they almost become the depth of like a floor in themselves. And so in ZKM, the idea is that, well, if we make those trusses a little bit deeper, then we can just have a whole floor, which is actually a truss. And then we can have a whole floor underneath it, which is the gap under the truss. And then we can have a floor underneath that, which is another truss. And that then we can have, rather than them all being the same truss, they can be a sort of family of different interesting looking trusses. So there can be one which is very dense vertically. There can be one which is like a fear and deal one with round things cut out of it. There's what, you know, they can be all sorts of different approaches and that you can have these floors which have their character given to them by the particular form of that structural member. And it's just, that's, it's very simple, but very ingenious um, application of that kind of structural idea. So this is another box from Delirious New York. The facade doesn't need to allude to that what goes on inside and what goes on inside can be various. And so you've got a box and in that box you've got layers and each layer is something exciting and different. A lecture theatre, which is a very specific shape, a contemporary art gallery, etc, etc, all in a stack. And then this time we really do have an office wall on one side, which is then separated by an atrium. And in the atrium is the place where everything is revealed. You've got, like the ferry terminal, strange bits of circulation which have been kind of manneristically arranged to make it a complex jaggle of escalators and bridges and bits of lifts and bits of through cuts and bits of building inserting. And then these penetrable walls with different functions with also different structural systems in it there are other things going on in the plan as well so in the, the top layer is this contemporary art all well, the plans of the floors are all completely different and also really labored like or really diagrammatic in well, such a one, way that you yeah. read them one is a circle the contemporary art museum is a circle which is just sitting i think does it even have are these voids in some yeah. places yeah, yeah, no, they're voids. so you can and the purpose is you can see in yeah. through here to this circle so we're seeing, and, we're and you can kind of glimpse it through the semi-permeable exterior of the building is the idea. So we're, this is real like, um, this is the sort of Manhattanism intensity, but explored through the language of, of Russian constructivism it's got. It's a stack of different shaped objects, each sliced into a nice floor slice, piled on top of each other, all different, th- which you can see through the semi-permeable membrane of the building, but more excitingly through this really kind of mannerist atrium so when you're in the spaces you're not really meant to know about the other ones they become apparent only really in the atrium it took me ages to work out what was going on in all the plans because they are drawn in such an obnoxious way (laughs) this is real like beginning of it white on black everything is in cad but like all visible and invisible lines are sort of switched on in such a way that it's just unreadable, the plans. And then he's produced these models, which are really cool, but I think also massively cheat. They're difficult because you, yeah, it's sort of difficult to locate yourself. There's lots of solid things are taken, like lots of things are taken out of it. To well, make I, it... Think, I think that these, the layering of spaces here, I think, is yeah, real. That's, like you would yeah, see that, that's through, real, yeah. through, through, through. It gives a real sense of the that's, drama yeah, of the, the lobby atrium. space. Yeah, the lobby atrium, cool. yeah. And then, yeah, the um, the facade is, in a way that actually the Pompidou Centre was meant to be, but it never happened. It is a surface for the projection of digital images, so it has like... It's, it's, it's on, like a cinema on screen. So one and a half size of the cube, it's expanded metal lath. Well, expanded metal, I mean, at a really big scale, which can be projected onto, but also can be seen out of. Um, and so sort of semi-transparent you know you know which is like metal which has got holes in it basically and then the other side it's the kind of back side is a wall with windows you know solid wall with windows and there's one one corner which is glazed this one's totally build ready you could you could just push the button on this one and is lavishly illustrated in SML XL. you really get the sense this is the one that got away and at the end of it they ha- it has this um, this sad essay about how the building came to came to not happen yeah which isn't that they didn't like his design it's just that um they they various various things happened uh germany got reunified that was one thing um the also a key politician was caught in a bribery scandal in thailand um and there are like various other things it's also illustrated with this this like who what is this photo yeah it looks like some year of lead like 
like someone's been assassinated in Italy. There's like picture, a photo of incredibly graphic photo of someone who's been assassinated, which but is it's, it's the, about the death that, of the project. These, these, those images, he inserts images of like violence and sexual images through it. Also, no, not pornographic specifically, rather than generally sexual yeah. images, which are provocations, and also because he likes the diversity. I think some of these ideas ended up in eventually in the Kunsthal, which is a smaller um, project which did get built. Uh, but yeah, it's a bit uh, a bit of a shame, this one. Yeah, it's Im- illustrated with these huge projections of sort of like weird smiling office workers on one side and um, a giant cowboy on the other. Um, <laughs> very much uh, of the time, I think, that kind of illustration. The massive image... Well, let's just talk about the sort of postscript, which is that... uh, So none of those got built in the end. There are two postscripts, one in the book and one in sort of real life. So these buildings are all really about the potential of these very large projects of bigness. Well, the projects don't even have to be that. They can be very, very large or they can be medium large. There is um, a later, and I think interesting project, which is where they have one last go at these kind of ideas, which is the... um, the Bibliothèque Jussieu in Paris, which is these two university libraries, which I think we don't need to say anything much about it, but in a sense, it's a, a bit of an expansion of the model of the spiraling library, which was in the centre of the Très Grand Bibliothèque. It's quite nice, and it, again, it has a really nice um, model. Uh, and those ideas eventually did end up, I think, being built in some form in the Seattle Public Library, which happened in the early 2000s i think and they did they did finally build a really big building in the 90s which was the congrexpo which is a big congress hall in lille part of the you know again part of the whole kind of channel tunnel project yeah this, and they did the whole big, lille master plan this big um interchange at, uh, in lille north of paris which has a whole lot of buildings there are lots of buildings by jean nouvelle and they um this is their their building was this big congress hall those kind of buildings are not inherently all that interesting, are they? Because it's basically just big halls. In this case, it's got two big halls. It looks like a stadium yeah. from the outside, but it's not. Yeah. And it's got a pattern on the top, which looks vaguely like a skull, yeah. but it's not. The story which is told about it in the book is that you can have every Mazda dealer in Europe in the presentation in one hall, yeah. and then all of these cars drive onto the stage and then they all get into them and drive away or something. Like, it has it has these... Well, that's uh, all Expos have got all those weird things. The stuff they do at, like, XL Centre for, for all the arms fairs. The arms fair, and then they have the arms fair and the yacht fair back-to-back because they can open up the canal to get all the, like... So one ship, they've got, like, all of the, like, rocket ships, and then the next day it's all of the, like, ridiculous billionaire yachts come in, like, come into the centre. Yeah, there's a certain enjoyment in the possibilities of that kind of programme, although I think the building itself is not all that interesting. Turning these into buildings sort of involves a succession of compromises. Um, Rather as they crystallise into buildings, they become... It's not that they become uninteresting or bad buildings. In crystallising them into buildings, they become something which is less rhetorical and the rhetorical strength of these is very very great yeah at the same time so i think that that's certainly true of the zeebrugge one where you you clearly identify that actually structurally resolving it is going to compromise it in a big way in one way or another in terms of tregron bibliotheque i think that the way that they choose that they work out to build it is staggeringly bizarre and wonderful and it makes it much stronger for having a, a clear structural Totally, but they hadn't designed. They, they would then have to turn it into like the shapes into things, and the things themselves would be a bit crap because of. Uh, yeah, they would be weird. They'd, they'd be, be weird, weird. And, and quite horrible to actually use. They'd be quite fun to go around, maybe, but it would be. You'd have to change them a lot. It doesn't mean they'll be bad, but they would, it would become less striking. It would become less the thing. Yeah, but definitely the structural design of it makes it better rather than worse. That one, and then Z- ZKM, I think, shows which is technically designed and was ready to build, I and think shows cool. how exciting it could be. It's really a really cool, cool building. But I think also you would lose a certain amount in turning what's there into something. It would, it would lose a certain amount of this exciting stack, which I think in a way, what it really wants is you to pull the facades off in a way. I think that one is limited by 
his idea of bigness is actually slightly getting in the way of the final resolution of that building, which is where you have to have an envelope which is kind of separate, which doesn't allude to what's going on inside. When what's so interesting with what's going on inside is this, is that it's a stack of different things, but that that is being blocked. I mean, I'm not sure that they would be improved by expressing that on the facade. I mean, I don't think that the facade is... No, but the boxiness of it, the sort of... You see it in the atrium, which is cool. I feel there's a way of opening out more that would be more... I don't know. I think it'd be all right. But yeah, it's definitely about interiors rather than exteriors, that building, yeah. isn't it? It's not about creating I mean, a monument all particularly. Way, he, he never designs buildings which are interested in like sitting in a place in a city. Normally, like... There's always a strong confrontation. It's like a confrontation. The best way is to have a, like, a big gap around them on all sides and then just have a big object. That's just how they how they are and that's fine you can have some of them cool um yeah so i think probably what we're gonna do because we've recorded a bit too much i think that we're gonna talk about the essay bigness on the bonus instead so this is uh, just to give you a, a preview of what that is it's a, it's an essay written for smlxl in which he attempts to sort of theorize what is going on in all of these buildings and it, i think it's i think it's quite interesting um but it'll definitely be good to to talk about so if you're a subscriber you can join us there i think we'll talk about other rem topics as well we might do some rem, glossing over some rem stuff generally yeah, we'll do a bit bit of other stuff um, there there are a lot more episodes that i'm sure we will do about rem in the fullness of time but not i think he kind of works better out of series yeah sure that's a more appropriate approach Remember, if you want to get that bonus content, you can subscribe for three dollars a month on our Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash about underscore buildings. We're now kind of committed to um putting one out every two weeks because of the subscribers. Yeah, which we, will, we, will we will attempt get, as best as we can to we'll hold get, we'll on. We'll get there as holding. soon as we can. Uh, you can also find we post images with every episode for your edification and clarity yeah on uh on social media of various kinds we are at about underscore buildings our editor is matthew lloyd roberts my god he's making our lives a bit better yeah it's making a big improvement so thanks very much matt and thanks a lot for listening yeah from 1989 yeah it's kind of interesting that it's that date isn't it yeah this is still feels kind of like late reagan mitterrand we are about to enter the world in which we now live the end of history yeah it's all happening it certainly is the end of something possibly the soviet union <laughs> yeah no i don't believe it <laughs> bye bye bye, bye.